Hey, Wendy, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Hi, Michael. It's great to be here. So where in the world are you calling in from? I am in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So you guys don't have a heat wave at the moment, or do you? Not at the moment. We actually have some nice, cool fall weather. We're thrilled to have some nice, cool fall weather. So you've escaped the heat dome, as they call it, on the West Coast. Well, that's good. (laughs) So let's get straight into it, Wendy. We've got a lot of interesting things to discuss. You do have a very storied career. But as a start, maybe talk the audience through some of your background in terms of your career, where you've developed these insights and so on. No, Michael, for your audience, I I actually started out as a management consultant. Uh, Wow. I did. I did. And I loved it. Um, I was working for Mercer Management Consultant. Spent a couple of years doing that. And one of the things that got me into this topic, so I've been studying this idea of both and thinking of paradox for about 20, 25 years now. And, you know, they say that for academics, research is me search we yeah. study things that we're not good at um one of the things that got me into this was my own career decisions i remember i was doing some fabulous consultant consulting i loved working with the clients um, but i was really interested in going deeper on the ideas and i was debating do i want to be an academic uh who studies ideas who yes. deepens our understanding of them or do i want to be a practitioner, a consultant, a manager, a leader, someone who had more direct impact in in, um, implementing these ideas. And that kind of either or question led me down a lot of grief as I tried to figure out, do I go back to grad school and get my PhD or do I continue on as a consultant? That's the kind of question that I've been studying for the last 25 years. So this arose from your experiences as a consultant and then in your personal life and that of your co-writer and colleague who you've done a lot of research with, it's not just in a professional setting. You've seen this in your personal lives. It's an underlying characteristic of all problems. But at the same time, what I notice is that when we experience a paradox, we tend to assume that we have to pick one and eliminate the other, but then we don't hold the whole problem in our head. So there's a lot to discuss here. Right? It's very exciting. But I want to break this down for the audience. Let's lay out the ground rules for the discussion in terms of the language we're going to use so they get a sense of how we're going to discuss things. Yeah. Um, and so the way that we entered into this space of thinking about paradox in both and is starting with the challenges that people, that leaders face on an ongoing basis. And we talk about those challenges as dilemmas, the experience of a trade-off, the need to make a decision. So in my personal life, it was, what's my career going to be? The way I started studying this as an academic was that I was studying IBM. I was uh, exploring how their top management teams of all of their strategic business units, their general managers and teams were navigating the tension of innovation. How do they manage to innovate, change, try something new? and at the same time manage their existing world, existing product. So um, consultants, leaders are really familiar with this kind of innovation and change issue. Um, And the question that often gets posed around that is how do people or how do organizations move from where they are today to where they need to be in the future? And what I was studying was, well, that's all nice and good, but the fact is, is that where they are today isn't going away anytime soon. In in the case of what I was studying, I was looking at how they were managing their client server technology while moving into what we now know as the cloud world and the web-based world. Well, the client server technology has not fully gone away. And in fact, their mainframe technology has not fully gone away. There's still mainframes around. So the the question, the, the sort of shift of the question was from how do they think about Uh, moving from today to tomorrow, their current world to their innovation and their new world into how do they accommodate both the today world alongside innovating and changing and disrupting the today world? How do they manage both of those simultaneously? And so we argue that underlying the dilemmas, they and then this causes dilemmas, right? So in the world of dilemmas, the language of dilemmas, the, the dilemmas they faced were things like, 
How do I allocate my resources? How do I yeah, organize bingo. my team? How do I structure myself? All of those kinds of questions that sort of demand answers and feel like they're trade-offs. Underlying that is what we talk about as paradox. Underlying all of those dilemmas is this ongoing paradox, these ongoing dualities that are actually interdependent, right? These, these contradictory features that are also reinforcing. And it's everything from thinking about today and tomorrow, short-term and long-term, managing the existing product and the innovation, where they come in conflict with, with each other. There's a tug of war and they also reinforce each other, right? The more effective an organization is today, the more successfully it can innovate. It has the resources to innovate. And the more that it energizes itself through innovation, the more it energizes and reinforces what it does today. So these, 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 um, the, the today and tomorrow world, the short-term, long-term world, these things are reinforcing of one another. And if we switch our focus to take a look at those paradoxes underlying the dilemmas, that's where we can come up with more creative possibilities, more sustainable, creative, novel ideas. And that's what we are looking at in this book, which is how do you do that? I love this example. I'm going to take the liberty here of taking this excellent example and paraphrasing it a little bit for the audience so they can follow along. So I see three pillars as such. The first one is we have a dilemma. Using the IBM example, we've got all these legacy businesses that are not going to go away. But at the same time, we've got to look forward and build businesses that are not like the legacy businesses. So that's the dilemma. The tension here is the fact that you've got one company with limited resources, and you've got to figure out how do you allocate limited resources to keep the legacy businesses going to fund the new businesses. The paradox here is that, well, it would appear that you need the legacy businesses to do well and thrive for the future businesses to have any hope of surviving. So while you want to go to the future, you can only go to the future if you protect the past a little. Is that a good way of thinking about it? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so this is amazing. I want to talk more about the paradox part, because I think the part about the dilemma, the two options is fairly easy for people to grasp. The tension, and I love the way you talked about allocation of resources, because then it's very easy to understand the tension. But let's talk about a paradox here. Let's talk about what is and what is not a paradox. So give me an example of something that would appear to be a paradox, but it's not really a paradox. So the audience can can see that difference. Yeah, and so this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, and so we're going to get a little complicated here. Yes. The dilemmas are the kinds of issues that pop up that, that require a decision. So the dilemmas that we saw the IBM leaders trying to navigate have X number of engineers. Do I spend more of them on yeah. R&D to update my existing product for my current customers? Or do I spend more of them on developing the innovations for the future? Th that's the dilemma. It requires yes. a solution. It's sort of the... The, the demanding trade-off that's right in front of you. Or I have my team, how do I structure my team? Do I create a subunit just for the innovation or do I embed the innovation needs within the whole team and across the team, across all the functional units? That's a that's a dilemma because that's a, that's a question that sort of requires an answer. The paradoxes then we would say, are actually a, a frame of a frame of understanding that underlies each of those dilemmas, underlying each of those decisions over time are these paradoxes of short term and long term, or the, these these into these these interwoven opposites. So so in the language it, in in the language that we use, we talk about the core and the explorer, the core world of what we currently do, and the explorer world. We are always going to face our organizations are always going to be facing a question of how do I manage the core world and the explore world and living in this ongoing balancing between the two of those that never goes away. That's the paradox or, you know, in terms of the legacy business and the new business, you're always going to be dealing with a tension between the legacy business and the new business. That's the paradox. That's not the decision that has to be managed at the moment. I like that. I also like the wording you use core versus explore. I haven't seen that before, but it's in my mind's eye, I can visualize it. It makes perfect sense. You've got a core business, which you know very well, 
but you've got to go out there with a large R&D budget and figure out, explore the future. So again, to get the audience to understand this, I'm going to use this way of thinking to apply to something I'm seeing in the news now, and let's see if we're applying it correctly, right? So you've got a situation where because of global warming and a whole lot of reasons, we're trying to move towards renewables. But at the same time, we've got to burn more coal, pump more oil, burn more gas to power the industries that are making that transition. Is that a good example of a paradox? Yeah, absolutely. Because what you're doing is you're thinking about the tension between a short-term goal and a long-term goal. And yeah, the, the core. You're creating yes. more, uh, more um, CO2s, you're releasing more greenhouse gases, you're creating more climate problems. And in the, But in the long term, you're creating, you're diminishing that. So how do you deal with that short-term, long-term issue? There's your paradox. Oh, so this is pretty interesting. So on top of the core versus explore, for both core and explore, you've got to consider the goals in the short term and the yeah. objectives, and then pay it up against what you're trying to achieve in the long term. Absolutely. That's a very nice framework. So let's bring this into examples whereby you've seen companies or individuals use this way of thinking successfully to solve problems. Yeah, and we can talk, you know, again, uh, we can talk about IBM and innovation or lots of companies in innovation that have always seen innovation yes. as the um, as cannibalizing their existing world, as opposed to innovation as something that's going to expand, enable, and develop their existing world, right? So IBM is a great example. And what I saw was actually variance across the different strategic business units. Some of the business units say, look, we've got to live in both of these and be navigating the balance between these. Some of the units were really um, trying to innovate and trying to accommodate both the innovation, the core and the explore, but the core world, as you know, can have such inertia to it that they weren't yes. able to do it. And so it really sort of held them, maybe sort of intensified around the core world. And in fact, what we know is that eventually the core dies out and the explorer becomes the core, meaning that the innovations, the new products for the future, eventually we move into the future, that becomes our legacy products. And in the, you know, the, the environment changes. And those companies, those, those strategic business units that were doing that, they actually started doubling down as we often see in business. Companies that are starting to die double down on what they've already done. They intensify. We talk about this as a vicious cycle, a, a rabbit hole. They get into a rabbit hole and intensify what they've already done. And it becomes really problematic. The other thing that we saw in some of these uh, IBM business units was the opposite, which is that you know, they had already doubled down on their existing world, but the existing world was starting to fail and new leaders came in and said, okay, we're moving straight into the innovation. And we actually talk about, and, and they totally um, started to diminish any resources to the core. They, they, stopped, they stopped investing in the core. We talk about this kind of pattern as overcorrecting. You've moved from, you've, you've focused on one side yes. of this equation You've doubled down on it. You've intensified it. We talk about it as going down a rabbit hole. Well, when the situation around you changes and you have to shift, you overcorrect. We talk about that as a wrecking ball because essentially what you do, it's like a wrecking ball. It sort of kills all of the good along with the bad and you're over intensifying into the new world. And so some of these business units at IBM overcorrected, totally focused on the innovation paid very little attention and resources to the core world, to their legacy world. And actually they ran into problems as well. They had left millions of dollars on the table. The innovation took some time in their startup. And so there was a gap in their revenues. It was also problematic. And so, you know, it was the companies that were, uh, sorry, the strategic business units at IBM that were able to manage both of these at the same time and live in this ongoing tension. That's what it feels like. It feels like an ongoing tug of war to live in this core and explore at the same time that we're able to do best. So the way I'm seeing the good example you gave, it's almost a symbiotic relationship whereby you've got to see the core as providing the fuel to get the explore to the point whereby it can produce its own fuel. But if you drain the core of resources whereby it runs out of producing fuel, aka free cash flow, the explore is never going to have the legs to get to where it wants to go. 
That's right. And, you know, just to sort of expand the mindset. So I initially studied this at IBM around innovation. Uh, I then spent a lot of time studying this around the issues of sustainability, corporate social responsibility, uh, ESG, or this world of trying to navigate both profits and the bottom line while simultaneously thinking about people and the planet and trying to address issues, broad, you know, broader issues, environmental, social governance issues. And we've seen an uptick of organizations thinking about that and trying to work through and manage that. And one of the issues that we see there is, again, how do you navigate this paradoxically? How do you think about the ways in which the ESG components yeah. enable profits rather than diminish them, rather than are seen as costs? And here we have a great example uh, in the book of Paul Pullman at Unilever, yeah. who famously developed the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, taking Unilever in 2008 at the worst downturn, he said, you know, I took over this company in the midst of a downward spiral, in the midst of a global economic crisis, and through and through the Unilever sustainable through the sustainable living plan, he was able to double profits through his commitments to environment, through his commitments to a, a set of social objectives. And so in this ESG world, I think we often think about this as a direct trade-off because ESG initiatives often feel really costly and yes. therefore feel like they are diminishing the bottom line. It's a trade-off. Well, the shift of mindset is to say, how do we understand this paradoxically? How do we understand the synergies? How can we understand that rather than thinking about these as just contradictory, that they are also reinforcing and value those synergies, value those interdependencies in order to make better decisions. And that's what Paul Pullman did, better strategic decisions about how to manage the company. And in reading that example in your book, one of many examples, one of the things that struck me is that, and we'll just stick on ESG because you brought it up, is that ESG is only a cost given the way companies have decided to approach ESG. It's their exactly. business model to managing ESG and a business model obviously can change and evolve, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, in this book, what we say is that the first step is uh, helping people see the ways in which we see these in the prisoner's model, the win-lose, the trade-offs, the zero-sum, and inviting people to see, well, actually, what if we saw it as the both-and, the win-win, the integrative, the the, the potential for synergies. So that's the first step, which is to say, wait, there is a potential for both and there's a potential for win-win. So that, that's the first, which is inviting people into this other possibility. The second step is to say, you know, we've actually seen a lot more of the language of both and, and particularly in the consulting world, uh, one thing that I've been, and, and this has been a real uptick over the last 20 years. So when I started most people were still talking either or. Now we see more language around, we've got to do the both and, we've got to live in paradox. So companies like PwC talk about the six paradoxes of leadership or um, Deloitte has a piece on, on how yes. to live paradoxically. Uh, there's a number of consulting companies that talk about this. Um, Barclays had a whole campaign about living in the and where they were talking about Main Street and online banking and FinTech banking. Uh, so there's like a whole... A uh, host of companies that are now using the label of both and or talking about living in the and or talking about navigating paradoxes and which means to them, how do we bring together opposing ideas and engage them simultaneously? The reason we wrote this book, though, was to say, OK, well, a lot of people are using this label. How do you actually do it? Yes. What does it actually mean to do it? Because once you go from the label to engaging this, it's actually not easy. And we have this like real benefit, uh, real privilege of having a whole community of academic scholars that have been working, that we've been working on these issues, our colleagues have been working on these issues. And so we wrote this book to bring together that scholarship and these ideas to say, here's some ways that you actually do this thing. Yes, and you've provided a good framework, I think as well, the one we discussed earlier, because it's very easy and intuitive to understand it. And it reminds me of a project we did many years ago whereby we we're working with the uh, Justice Department in an emerging markets economy. And we were talking to the chief of police and chief of prisons, and they were telling us the biggest problem they have is not when they capture the criminal. It's when they put them into prison, the prisons turn them into even hardened criminals. And when they are released, they even 
cause more trouble in society. And I remember at one stage, they brought in the chief of police and chief of prisons from many different countries. And they brought in a lady who ran prisons, I think in one of the Nordic countries. And she said, the way they solve that paradox is that you don't think of prison as punishment. Right. You think of it as rehabilitation. And that's a good example, I think, of you only figure out that solution if you keep the paradox in your mind. That's right. If you realize that actually these are people who probably need to be taken off the street for a period of time, but the question is not how do we punish them? How do we help them reemerge in society? I think about my colleagues who do really fabulous work in this area of restorative justice. Yes. How do we create the possibilities of a pathway for somebody to feel like they have become whole again so that they can become more productive members of society? And in fact, the people who come out of prison who have gone through pro programs like that and who have been listened to and who yes. uh, have been able to really feel more restored are often quite productive members of society. They really do make a huge contribution to society. So absolutely. I want to explore the area of paradoxes even more, but not from the perspective of how it impacts organizations and strategy. I want to think about this from the perspective of a leader who has this paradox and needs to hold it in their head. Because I used to be a strategy partner and I've worked with many CEOs. And what I've noticed is that obviously there are some CEOs who are very confident. They know what they're doing. They are willing to talk about the paradox because they don't think it's a failure in their intellectual capabilities. But I have seen other leaders whereby when faced with a paradox, they almost want the paradox to go away. And they want to avoid the paradox at all costs. And basically what they want to do is they want to say no paradox exists. The problem is pretty straightforward, but I find that they almost lose the opportunity to solve the real problem by taking that stance. So my question to you is, how do we get leaders comfortable in accepting that all problems have some kind of paradox in them? And we shouldn't try to minimize it. We shouldn't treat it as an anomaly, but we got to accept this is a standard way of solving problems. How do we, we teach them that? I, I love that question. And, and actually, I think there's two parts to this question about leadership. One is how do we get the leaders comfortable? And then how do the leaders translate that to the rest of their organization? Yes. And we've been working on projects on both of those. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the, in the book is how do we help people change their mindsets? And what we are aware of is that this is not just a mindset shift, but there's an emotional component to it as well, in which we have to be able to recognize that navigating paradoxes is actually quite uncomfortable. Uh, it's uncomfortable because it leaves us a little bit anxious because there's not always certainty. Sometimes we're leaving the question open for longer than we want. It leaves us feeling uncomfortable because we're not always being consistent. In fact, one of the strategies that we talk about for managing paradoxes to be consistently inconsistent, which means that we're sort of navigating, shifting, ongoing shifting back and forth between opposing ideas in order to, in the big picture, accommodate both ideas. And we don't, you know, people aren't always that accommodating of their leaders being consistently inconsistent. So that's uncomfortable. And you know, I think to your point, some leaders are able to put aside their ego, but for the but some for some of us, you know, we get committed to a point of view and then we get defensive of that point of view and aren't open to listening to somebody who has an alternative point of view and considering how that might impact our decision making. So all of these factors lead us to be un uncomfortable. So I, I think that there is the work to do to help people shift their mindset. That to me is actually the easier side of the work. Um, and there, I think that the answer in part lies with the questions that we're asking. How do we change the question? So if we notice that we're asking an either or question typically, how can we shift to change the question to ask a both and question? Instead of asking, should I focus on X product or Y product? Should I focus on X region or Y region? Uh, how can I accommodate both X region and Y region, X product and Y product. How can I both achieve, uh, you know, doubling my profits and achieving my you know, commitments to the planet and to a social mission? So 
changing the question helps us to shift our mindsets. I think the other side of this, as I started to say, is also helping people to recognize that we have to shift our emotions around this. And here we talk about the importance for leaders and for people to what we say is find comfort in the discomfort. And what we mean here is to notice that it's actually uncomfortable. We might feel defensive. We might feel uncertain. Not to pretend that those things don't exist, but to acknowledge that those things do exist, accept them, and find ways in which we can be more comfortable with that discomfort that we feel as leaders. I like that. This is brilliant. So let's take this one level down, right? So you've got CEOs and the executive teams and the board who make decisions, but their decisions are interpreted in the media. Yeah. And the media needs to also have this way of viewing problems. And I'll give you an example of this. It's something I wrote about recently, whereby you've got companies that are listed on the, let's say, London Stock Exchange, which have very strong rules in place for disclosures, transparency, and a very vociferous and vocal shareholder group. Now, you would want those companies managing coal mines until you have to close down coal mines. Yeah. But the press says you got to exit coal, but coal is not going anywhere for a long time, which means that companies that are not held to such high standards are going to be managing these coal mines. Mm -hmm. So here's a classic example where the way I would think about it is I would actually want BHP Bulletin to be managing coal because they are the best in the world at mining. They know what they are doing. And then when it's time to phase out coal, we can do it. But while it exists, let them do it. So the question here is, it's one thing to educate leadership and so on, but how do we get the investment community along on this way of thinking? Yeah, um, you know, one of the issues with being able to communicate paradoxes, we talk about it as moving up a level. Yeah. And what that means is being able to communicate the overarching vision for a company, it might be the higher, the purpose of the company. Some people talk about it as a higher purpose, the why, the overarching vision that accommodates the competing ideas within it. So I think the challenge for leaders is to be able to communicate the integrative overarching vision of why we are engaging with coal to get rid of coal how we are managing that transition over time. You know, I'll give you an example. I was doing, I've been doing some work with some colleagues in Canada about the Canadian oil sands, which yes. is fits right into the space, which, you know, environmental groups that they have been dubbed dirty oil and the yeah. tar sands and, you know, and, and shut them down immediately. Well, shutting them down immediately will cause all kinds of second order problems for all of the you know communities across Canada, both in Alberta, but then across yeah. Canada that rely deeply on the economic benefits of the oil sands. So they, so they have an organization out there called COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, uh, that was launched in 2005 in order to bring together these highly competitive companies in order to work together toward cooperative solutions toward in increased environmental possibilities. Well, is that good enough for environmentalists? Well, in the role of the environmentalist is to still push hard to encourage them to go further and further on their environmental standards. And their job is, as an innovation alliance is to figure out how do they work to continue their economic development while simultaneously making themselves more environmental. So that is, you know, some, some people would say, just shut them down. Well, again, shutting them down is going to have second order detrimental impact. So how do you think about the relationship between trying to move toward an environmental standard and at the same time thinking about the impact that they have? That's a both and. Yeah, it's a good one, because when you think about coal and oil, I mean, I think a very good example for this is the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which gets, I think, all of its money from oil and gas. But in terms of the way it invests and what it demands of the company's way it invests is probably one of the most socially responsible investors in the world. But at the same time, it only has that influence because it makes money from oil. Yeah. And I want to be clear because there's an important distinction here between, you know, the ESG community has talked a little bit or pushing. Are you just sort of like doing something nice over here so that you divert the yes. attention from what we're doing over here? And I think there's a difference between, for example, what Paul Pullman was doing, which is to say, how can I use the influence of my economic benefit in service of enabling of 
these social and environmental standards. He wasn't shirking. The, the social and environmental standards weren't things that he was just sort of layering on top like a nice icing. It was he was figuring out over time how to integrate it deeply into the business, which was pushing the organization to be incredibly innovative, incredibly creative in how they thought about the work that they did, developing new possible solutions along the way. So I think it's important that we, it's not just that these things are sitting side by side. Yes. In the Canadian oil sands, part of the question is how do we do our work more environmentally? And if that means increasingly shutting down what we do, how do we make that transition so that we do so in a way that is economically supporting the communities that we work for? Well, it comes back to what you said about core and explore. Uh, yeah. Initially, your core business is not going to be what you want it to be, but the goal is to make that transition eventually. It's not to have a good business and a bad business running together forever with this conflict of interest. It's You've got the issues with the core, you understand what the issues are, but the goal is we want to make a full transition whereby when we get to the explore part, we've got a business that, as you, know, you use the example of Unilever, it's not transitory. The profits are there. The business model works. You can build a business off this. Yeah. And if I were to take these stories and put them into a sort of a model or a framework format, at one, you know, we basically say, look, there's four kind of key buckets, four sets of tools that you need in order to live in this ways of finding these integrative solutions, right? And we touched on two of them earlier where we talked about how leaders and individuals think about these issues. Are they able to see the tensions and apply both and thinking, so their mindsets. And we talk about that as assumptions. And then we talked about their emotions. We talk about that as comfort. The piece that we're pointing to right now is we talk about it as dynamics, right? The need to be ongoing, changing, uh, agile, shifting, yes. flexible, experimenting, and growing and developing along the way. So, you know, so again, we talk about these four buckets and we, we label them for ease of remembering as A, B, C, D. So it's assumptions. And that's what we talked mm -hmm. about as mindsets. The second group we, we say are boundaries, which is the scaffolding, the structures, the roles, the, the, the goals, the vision that helps scaffold us to stick in this both and thinking. The third is the C, comfort, the emotions that we bring to this. And then the fourth is D, dynamics. And the dynamics is exactly what you're pointing to, which is that part of being able to live in this paradoxical world is dynamically shifting over time. Yes, that's right. It's you know, there used to be a time whenever you did these transformation programs in companies, the CEO would say the transformation is going to end after two years, but it never really ends. You're constantly moving. It's a constant state of change. When I used to work in Canada many years ago, I used to work with some colleagues from different consulting firms. And one of the ideas that we were working with was something called integrative thinking, yeah. whereby we'd have two opposing models at the same time in our head and try to figure out, okay, these are opposing models. It's not about picking either one. It's about figuring out how do we pull the elements that are best from both to come up with a better solution. It's very similar to what you're talking about, but you have articulated a lot better and you've laid sort of the foundations and the pins to hold it together. Because I remember once we were working with a state-owned bank and they were making a lot of money doing uh, corporate deals and so on. But the government said, you've got to go in and provide services to the unbanked. And it was going to be loss-making for them. And they were... That was a paradox for them because in the one hand, if you took all the profits from the corporate side and you put it into the retail bank for the unbanked, you'd probably destroy the bank. But then we were thinking about it, what if you rethought this? What if you developed products to serve the unbanked that were actually profitable? It's a different way of thinking about it. Right. And I just want to pull out sort of the structure or the framework of, of how, how, how that works. One of the boundaries of scaffolding, which I, we talk about is separating and connecting. And so integrative thinking is very much about that. Both and thinking is very much yes. about that. And when we say separating and connecting, what we mean is that we have to, if we're going to think about the retail banks and the you know online banks or what have you, we have to be, in, and we're going to think about how they're integrative. The first step to do is to separate them. Before we can yes. connect them, we have to separate them. And separate means what do we understand to be the benefits of each of these, each, each piece? What is unique about each piece? What are we trying to accomplish? What's the goals of each piece? What's the metrics associated? What's the time frame? What are the skills? What are each of the components of each of these different strategies? 
And it's through that that we can then say, okay, what are the ways in which we can see the tactical integration, the synergies between them, the ways in which we can refigure our overall strategy to accommodate each of these pieces. But we can't get to being able to get to a better decision until we actually look at what's unique about each of these different strategic businesses. And so, you know, that's true of what do, that's true of ESG issues. What do we need for our environmental goals? What do we need for our economic goals? And then what's the ways in which we can do this better? Or I uh, was doing some work for um, a bank in the UK and they were thinking about online versus retail. Well, there was a lot of either or talk about whether banks were going to be, you know, uh, Main Street or online, whether which one they were going to pick. And the, the truth is, is that these can reinforce one another if we understand exactly to your business what a retail bank is going to do in order to invest and enable the online banking and vice versa. Yes. And I wonder if you've also experienced this in your career. But I think one of the greatest enemies of this way of thinking is benchmarking. Mm. it's when you try to do something that someone else is doing, but you don't know why they're doing it. Uh, interesting. interesting. And I've seen many companies fall for this trap whereby if they're number two, number three, or number seven in the space, they'll say, well, the number one, two, three companies are doing this. We have to do it as well. Even though their resources are different, their strategy is different. Even the paradoxes they face are different. Right. So they're applying a, a solution to solve a different set of paradoxes. And it never works, right? I mean, you, I'm sure you've studied companies like Southwest. How many people have tried to copy them? Right. And they've right. never been able to do it because it's a different set of paradoxes. So what I always think about is that when I was reading the book and your work and so on, is I was thinking not so much about companies, but I was thinking about the executive who's sitting there at 8 a.m. And he's trying to firstly take what is a very powerful way of thinking, but then get his colleagues to think about the business in the same way. I think that's always going to be the hardest part. Yeah, you know, um, I, I recently did some work with a company in Hong Kong um, and they had brought in a new CEO from Canada and this company um, uh, was an investment bank and they had all kinds of ways that they did. They were very nice to one another. It was a very old bank. They uh, There was a lot of, you know, human touch. And the CEO said, okay, well, this is all nice and good. And we really want to value all of these values that we've had so far. And we've got to transition and be able to also be more agile. We've got to hold each other more accountable. We have to move into a more digital age. And he was really trying, and everybody freaked out because as you know, when somebody, a new CEO comes in and brings in a whole new strategy, it really causes a lot of anxiety. Organizational change creates some, some reaction and resistance. His point was, no, we don't want to get rid of this old culture. We want to create this new culture and these new values side by side. So he started talking about it as navigating their value pairs and how could they do that? Well, that wasn't easy to do. And um, because people were really trying to say, well, which one do you want? And yes. what we find with leaders is, again, there's a, there's a couple of strategies that work really well. The first is going back to their why and reminding their um, their their company, how all of these competing ideas are in service of the bigger, longer term vision. Uh, we worked with an organization, a small social enterprise in Newfoundland that we write about in the book, uh, and uh, their CEO is constantly talking about the long term vision and how this is a, a small social enterprise that's trying to redevelop their community by creating a luxury inn in Fogo Island. Uh, and so people are coming there and spending $3,000 a night to a place that is one of the farthest corners yeah. of the earth. Yeah, Finland is pretty to. far. It is amazing. As an, and what they're trying to do is honor the tradition of how they've always lived as an island in this, this beautiful place. And at the same time, modernize. They're trying to be highly local in valuing all of the culture of what they've always done and enter into the global economy. And so she's constantly reminding people that the long-term view here is how do we sustain our community and our ways of being into the future? Well, the only way to do that is to continue to value what we already do and to change in order to be able to modernize into the future. And they, and one of the things that we've learned from uh, her, her name's Zita Cobb, uh, is to really talk in 
metaphors in stories. We know the value of storytelling for yes. companies to be able to bring people along. Um, and so she uses stories, she uses metaphors, she uses poems uh, on an ongoing basis. And what we're finding is that, and, and so for example, one of the metaphors, they their, their symbol is a cauliflower. And the reason that they use a cauliflower is because they wanna convey this idea of what it means for local and global to be integrated. So they talk about the stem of the cauliflower being the global economy. The stronger the stem, the more that it could support the florets, which are each of the distinct communities around the world. And yet each of these distinct florets are in fact distinct and unique and they have to sort of sprout in their own way. So they talk about cauliflower thinking. The, the benefit of doing that, they also have this, this great poem, The Art of Walking Upright, which is from a New Zealand poet. And it's the art of walking upright is both having one foot planted on the ground and another foot moving forward, reminding us that we both have to be stable and dynamically shifting. So these metaphors uh, don't tell people exactly what to do, but what they do do is invite people into a different way of thinking about what to do, invite them into this integrative thinking, invite them into understanding paradox, invite them into both and thinking. And, and the reason what we're finding in this work that we're doing is that one of the reasons it's really valuable to tell these stories, to use these metaphors, to use these poems, is because we all approach these ideas in a lot of different ways at a lot of different levels. And by these metaphors are like, you know, they're kind of like an onion. We get to peel them to the layer at which we are able to understand at the moment. So some people might delve deeply into understanding the complexity of the paradoxes and deeply, and, or deeply into the complexity of the story and how it reflects paradoxes. And some people might be at a more surface level, but everybody can then enter in at the level at which they're comfortable and be invited in to thinking about this new way of thinking. I love this example. I mean, besides people from New Finland probably having the most awesome Canadian accent in the world, <laughs> the example of metaphors is a very powerful one because it neutralizes personalities. It's not a personal attack. I mean, if you're sitting in a boardroom and you're talking about why the wireless division is not doing well, you've got the wireless executives there being defensive automatically, right? But if you're using a metaphor to convey a point, nobody is being personally attacked. Yeah. Nobody's being judged. There's no baggage. It's brand new. Everyone's seeing it for the first time. You can exploit together. So I love that example. And I think it's a very powerful way to do it. So metaphors are a great way. I've never heard of anyone using a cauliflower metaphor <laughs> ever. And I've been to 54 countries. So thank you for that <laughs> new imagery. I'll give you one other because yeah. I think it's also another good one. Uh, we write about and had done some work with Terry Kelly, who had been the CEO of WL Gore and Associates. They are the uh, they 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 create um, Gore Tex, and okay. they this company was started with a culture of the power of small teams. They were all about small teams and empowerment and local decision making. And that was all nice and good when uh, Bill Gore started the company, when there was 200 people in the company. Terry Kelly took this company over and there was something like 35,000 people across the world. And they were still making decisions in small teams and there was very little enterprise-wide integration. And so she was trying to reinforce the importance of these small teams are really still important and local empowerment is still core to our culture and who we are. And we have to have some kind of global integration of our strategy so that we're all pulling in the same direction. How do we do both of these? So their metaphor is that when people would sort of, you know, they would get a lot of pushback on small teams. It's all about small teams because that was just core to who they were. Uh, their metaphor that they used was breathing. When you breathe, you have to both breathe in and breathe out. You can't just do one or the other. And so when they, you know, in order to live, in order to survive, and so when people would push back on this global enterprise-wide strategy, she would talk about, look, we've got to breathe. We still have to breathe in and breathe out. We can't just pick one of these. So it was like a reinforcing that. mechanism to say, look, this is, this is why we're doing both of these. And, you know, we've got to really understand that we need both of these in order for our long-term survival. What I like about these uh, metaphors and so on is they're very pleasant and soothing because in a lot of the business world we take a lot of military and sports metaphors which are quite alienating if you really think about it. it's about pain suffering grit blood torture 
and someone's going to die because there's not enough for everyone to to basically mm-hmm. benefit, right? So I have noticed that when you talk to executives who are good at holding opposing models and paradoxes in their mind, they are always looking for a common ground. Yeah. So they always choose metaphors that reflect that. Yeah. And it's a very different way of thinking because it's not a zero-sum game at the end of the day. I think that's the key thing when you hold paradoxes in your head. It's only a paradox because of the way you've chosen to approach the problem. Yeah. Michael, I love that. Uh, I, I once did a talk for um, a group of leaders of sport uh, in Stockholm. Yeah. So Stockholm School of Economics has a wonderful center for sport management. And they brought together the national leaders of different sport across Stockholm across uh, the country. And um, and so, you know, I, I said to them, look, how do we move from win-lose to win-win? How do we move from either or, either you win or I win, either you're right or I'm right, to, to we're both right, to we can have competing ideas at the same time, to win-win. And, you know, one of the leaders said, well, that's all nice and good, but if you're on the pitch, it's, you know, the rules are, I can't collaborate with you for win-win. And I said, well, yeah, that's all, that's true. But the problem is, is that you take that mentality on the pitch and you bring it into the back office, you bring it off the pitch, you bring it into your everyday life. And so I, I do think that it's more than just the metaphor of sport. It's that we bring that whole mentality that the rules are one of us has to win. And that is a very zero sum mentality that prevents us from getting to a better place and leaves us, you know, in a lot of conflict. Yeah, I'm a big sports guy. I remember speaking to New Zealand rugby player, the All Blacks. Yeah. And I was trying to get a sense of the culture because they're known as having one of the strongest cultures in the world whereby they don't play for money. They're not allowed to sign contracts outside of the country. They have to play in the domestic leagues and so on. And the way he explained to me is the reason why there's such character and depth and drive in the All Blacks is because no one's trying to win that game. Mm. they're trying to make the sport win Mm. and the example he gave by that he's saying that if we did everything we could to win Mm. what example do we set for the five-year-olds watching us and how will the game turn out in 25 years when these people are playing and they've learned to win at all costs and i love that example because he's winning the game was not winning that game it's winning the whole game it's a very different way to think about sports right well, well, and I love that. I almost have goosebumps from listening to it because it is really push it, putting on the table the long term. One yeah. of the things to say about being able to think both and is bigger picture, longer term. And if you can look out to the bigger picture, not just my company, but all boats rise collaboratively across an industry and the long term possibilities, you're not stuck in the short term competitive mode. Then you're able to explore what's it like to accommodate these opposing, they bring together these opposing ideas. That's what enables you to do it. My, my colleagues, Natalie Slowinski and Timo Bansell have a great paper in which they look at, again, companies in the oil sands, the ones that are able to hold these environmental possibilities more profoundly are the ones that have a longer term, bigger picture vision. Yes. And it's also, I mean, here, here's the rub. It's the companies that end up doing better. The all blacks end up doing better by taking this bigger picture vision. Yes. So it's it's quite profound. You know, I'll tell you one one quick thing. So in um when I train around this, I often use this exercise of arm wrestling. So some yeah. of the folks out there might have used this in trying to train around why there's benefit in working collaboratively and not be in conflict. And again, to, to me, this collaborative is you have a point of view, I have a point of view, they might be different. Let's stop and understand our two different points of view do a deeper dive on each and think about where we can think about collaboration or what the both and is. And what I do is I have uh, the participants in these sessions arm wrestle. (laughs) So first of all, it's always good (laughs) as you know, when you're facilitating workshops to get people out of their seat and out of their head for a minute, uh, because that helps us learn better. So I, I have them arm wrestle and I, and I say to them, you know, what, how do you win in arm wrestling? And so you win in arm wrestling by getting the other person's hand down. Okay, so then I say you have 30 seconds to arm wrestle, but what what the win here is, is that it's you have 30 seconds, not just to get the other person's hand down once, but to see how many times you can get, you can each get the other person's hand down. And the person that comes up with the most number of times wins. Well, you know, then you get people arm wrestling and you can see groups are fighting against one another and, and struggling and defending and trying to, and 
you know, all of the time, there will be one group that will realize that they can change the rules of the game. And instead of being in this competitive relationship where if I win, you lose, or you win, I lose, they realize they can collaborate and stop pushing and defending against each other and just go back and forth. And so then in 30 seconds, they can put each other's arm down a hundred times rather than once. Yes. And they can both win in that case because nobody was saying that only one of them was gonna win out of this team. And so it's this illustration of how quickly we fall into the win-lose mentality, the zero-sum mentality, the competitive mentality, rather than exploring and thinking about what does it mean if I help you, if I expand what's possible for you? And, and we see this in business, right? We see businesses in which they can understand what it means to be more collaborative across the industry are often the businesses that are doing much better. Yeah, it's about thinking beyond yourself, right? You know, I always think the number one mark Beyond all the things you measured leaders on, it's succession planning. Mm, yeah. Are you going to leave the company better off than when you first joined? But the thing that struck me about this New Zealand example is that when we think about succession planning, we think about the next person that's going to replace us. This guy was thinking about someone who's going to arrive in 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole different way to think about succession planning. It just It's something I've never seen anyone talk about, 20-year succession planning. I mean, maybe we can take a page from the indigenous peoples around the world that talk about seven generations. I mean, that goes out even further. How do seven I think about generations. the impact that I have at seven generations and what impact will that have on my short-term decision-making? And I think that oftentimes it's very impactful for more profound decisions that we're going to make right now. I like that because it also is a paradox, right? Because it's a paradox, people will say, well, I can't do that. Seven generations, I can't even plan five years, right? I can't even plan the week. Right. Great. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. One of our better podcasts. In fact, you know, I speak to many business leaders, CEOs, sports celebrities, leaders of sports teams and so on. But I think it's very rare when someone introduces a new way of thinking about things. And I think you've done that. And I like it because I think it makes us all better if we see things for what they really are. Well, Michael, thank you for saying that because we do, we, we, we really believe that there's lots of problems in this world and we would do a better job solving those problems and creating more creative solutions if we're able to come together across very different opinions, very different perspectives, learn from each other and come to better solutions. So I hope this is useful to the people that are listening to your podcast. Well, I loved it. So I think they're going to love it too. Have a great day and I hope to have you on the show again. It's great to talk to you. Take care. Ciao.